Hello, everybody. Welcome to another chapter of diversity. Uh, today, well, today's first of all, our lecture is uh, sponsored by the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles. Uh, it's an amazing Holocaust museum, uh, in which when you um, enter it, you get a passport of someone who was swept up in the Nazi Holocaust, and you go through a kind of uh, a, a, a version of what they might have gone through it time wise including going into gas chambers and being on um, box cars and it's really incredibly powerful but the thing i remember the most about that visit is at the end of the museum of tolerance which is just about the incredible savagery of the nazi regime against so many different people including people with disabilities and queer people and obviously jewish people and left-leaning people, I mean, the socialists and the communists were sent to the camps as well, is the guest book at the end, where you sign your name and where you came from and any thoughts you have. And I was going to sign, you know, Randy Blazak, Portland, Oregon. Uh, and someone had written right before me, this was really sad, but if the Jews had accepted Christ as their savior, this never would have happened. How about that? Let that sink in for a bit. And I just wrote underneath it with an arrow pointing up at it, like, this is why the Holocaust happened, this type of thinking. Um, so Museum of Tolerance, I highly recommend it. A uh, very sobering experience. They do a lot of great programs on reducing hate in the community, run through the Simon Wiesenthal Center. And I'm also wearing my Cutter's t-shirt. So bonus points to anybody that knows the reference of this t-shirt. Maybe some film buffs out there. All right, so what we're talking about today, I wanted to talk about feminist theory and how feminism helps us to think about um, diversity, what the inner, <coughs> excuse me, what the intersection of feminism and diversity is. And so we're gonna, I'm going to give you a kind of a background of feminist thinking and theory and some of the different ideas in it, and then at the end kind of link it to uh, this topic of diversity. Okay, so here we go. We're going to do this kind of in, in four sections. The first section is just sort of defining our terms and what feminism is. And feminism uh, gets a lot of attack from people who don't know what it is. I mean, even on some of the YouTube videos I've posted already, the one on intersectionality has somebody complaining about feminists. Um, and I don't think people really understand the basic idea of what feminism is. And it's a broad umbrella that just it essentially recognizes the humanity of females. That's it. That women are people too. Uh, that women have hopes and dreams and aspirations and a right to all the things that men have, for which for many years in a patriarchal society, many centuries, was disregarded. That women were seen as attachments to men and women were you know, ill-formed versions of men and so on and so forth. So the first part of recognizing uh, what feminism is, is it's a recognition of the, just the humanness of women. And the second part of that is the recognizing the persistence of patriarchy, of the power structure that advantages men and disadvantages women. So you can't be a feminist without knowing that patriarchy is a thing. You don't have to have that word for it. And I would argue that all women all people who define themselves as women, I should say, uh, understand that there is a disadvantage to being female in the society. There are some advantages, but there are some real disadvantages, including the incredible rate of violence against women, the glass ceiling, sexual harassment, being devalued as you age, right? Men just get more distinguished as we get older. Look at that gray hair right there. Women, you know, have to fight it with every, uh, every tool in the tool shed. Uh, and on and on and on. And I think all women sort of understand this, whether or not they call themselves feminist or not. Um, like ra racism, uh, patriarchy is systemic. It's woven into the systems, the systems of the family, the systems of business, the systems of education. All our systems have, from a feminist perspective, uh, an energy that reinforces patriarchal power and patriarchal viewpoints. But it's also personal in our interpersonal relations. How men shut down women, how men don't listen to women, how men disregard women, or how women internalize those views about themselves, right? We talk about internalized white supremacy by people of color. Women can also internalize patriarchy. That all I am is a pretty face, and if I'm not a pretty face, I'm not anything, right? That type of thinking. Um, it's also built on the binary, right? The gender binary is one of the first binaries that we learn in life that you're, you're either male or female, 
right? And those, that biology is destiny. Um, this is some of the stuff that uh, Michael Kimball talks about in his piece that you're reading this week, that there is this sort of biological uh, predetermination and it's not socialized or it's not learned or it's not cultural. Uh, and that binary sets up a lot of later binaries. And you could make the argument, as we will at the end of this, that the binary about gender sets up the binary about race and all the other binaries that we live and die by. Um, and also, uh, it sees women as incomplete. Uh, feminism recognizes that patriarchy has infantilized, infantilized women, which means make women children, the way we talk about grown women as girls, right? Uh, I don't know, I'm dating, I, I was, back in the dating days, I was uh, having drinks with a professor, a female professor of mine. She says, Randy, what's going on with your, um, in your personal life? What are you doing? You know, how is it going? Do you have a, do you, are you in a relationship? And I'm like, yeah, I'm dating this girl. Uh, she said, well, you're dating a girl. How old is she? Is she like eight? I'm like, I know, I think she's 28. She's like, that's what we call a woman, Randy. That is not a girl. Um, so the way we inf infantilize women and see them as somehow defective, whether it's Freud's penis envy or the notion that women are somehow incomplete versions of men, that we're the fully formed Adam created, uh, Adam, God, God created Adam in his image. And then women were kind of like the afterthought, like, oh, you're just a spare rib. But, you know, God uh, is truly reflected in the man, not the woman. There's a lot of religions that buy into that. So when we talk about what we mean by feminism, even though there's all kinds of different feminisms, some of which we'll talk about, uh, what they all have together is a recognition uh, of that women are people, women and girls are people, and that there has been created this power dynamic. So the way I like to draw it is there's a, di there's a binary, male and versus female, and it sort of flipped into a power dynamic, so male over female. So it's still a binary, but it grants men power. So that's sort of an easy way for me to kind of think about these two aspects. So the male and female is opposites, you know, and uh, the Kimmel piece reminds us of the men are from Mars, women are from Zenith. Zena? Zena? Zena, the princess warrior? Women are from Venus type of thinking uh, that we're from completely different planets, which is such a crock of shit. I'm here to tell you. I mean, as we get older, that whole notion about the differences, I mean, I love that diagram in that reading because there's a lot more that we have in common than we have different. I don't have fallopian tubes. Fallop fallopian tubes. That was one of my favorite 80s bands, the fallopian tubes. Uh, so, so when we talk about feminist thinking, there is kind of a historical evolution, and it can go way back, whether you're talking about, you know, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad or you're talking about... Uh, the, the woman who wrote Frankenstein, who wrote it as a, her mother was a very famous uh, feminist in the early days. I mean, there's this long lineage of the notion of female humanity and the power. So, but when we talk about feminist theory uh, in the modern era, we kind of link it into this notion of waves, that there are these waves that happen. So this, and just if you hear this, I want you to kind of be familiar with this language. When we talk about the first wave feminist theory, um, there, we really are talking about the American and, and European suffrage movement. That women did not have the right to vote a little over 100 years ago in this country. Women's vote was perceived to be uh, reflected in the men that they marry. If you want to vote, marry a man and he will vote for you. Your mind, and of course there was a lot of thinking that women, you know, once a month will go crazy. So how can we trust them with the vote? Uh, and there was so much opposition from mainstream media, including the New York Times, to giving women the right to vote. And so the first real feminist movement took on that issue, took also on reproductive rights and getting women access to safe abortion and contraceptive uh, devices to allow them to control their uh, biological lives as well. And so the first wave feminist movement is really the beginning of the 20th century. You think about, about people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Stanton or Susan B. Anthony and some of those famous names, um, Lucy Stone. And some men as well, who are very uh, supportive of it, including W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, and then the second wave feminist movement really starts in the early 1960s. And so I've already talked about this a bit when we were talking about Betty Friedan and the feminine mystique, taking on not just the political issues of the first wave, but those social issues, the ingrained nature of patriarchy. So most famously uh, in that movement was the burn the bra incident, where... Uh, 
when they were protesting the Miss America pageant and saying, hey, we're more than a pretty face. We're people, you know, too. And we're not here to be sort of idol ogled and fetishized by men. We are people, you know. And so if you know about the bras in the 50s and the 60s, they were probably the least comfortable bras. I can't even imagine those pointy pointy bras. Uh, and so one woman took off her bra and said, you know, this bra was created by a man for men to look at women's bodies and I'm burning it. And it sort of started this notion of the bra burners. But what really that was, wasn't just about, you know, free the breast, which sort of comes later. It is about allowing women to be who they are and not be created for men's eyeballs. And so the feminist movement took on, uh, the second wave feminist movement took on sexual harassment, took on sexual violence, took on pornography. Uh, um, Gloria Steinem, who's one of the more famous names from that movement, went undercover to work at the Playboy Club to write about the sexism in the Playboy industry, which was huge in the 60s and 70s, uh, and really changed a lot. Title IX comes out of the second wave feminist movement. You know, if you're going to spend money in schools, uh, on male sports, you got to spend the same amount on female sports. That's from the second wave. Laws against sexual harassment, including the Title IX laws, uh, come out of the second wave feminist movement. And then in the late 80s and early 90s, there becomes a third wave feminist movement. And the third wave feminist movement is more intersectional. As we talked about uh, in the in the Vic the video on intersectionality, a lot of women of color were left out of the second wave feminist movement. So the third wave feminist movement tries to talk about the experience of other women, including trans women and lesbian women and black women and Latina women and Pacific Islander women and all and older women and younger women and all these women that are, are left out and also try to make feminism less monolithic. And so sometimes we refer to third wave feminism as postmodern feminism because it brought it down to the local. So you can be a feminist and wear makeup, right? You can be a feminist and wear high heels. You find your own route to empowerment. And I did a presentation a long time ago in a time called the late 1990s about the, the Spice Girls. I don't know if any of you know the Spice Girls. If you want to be my lover, got to get with my friends. There was a real feminist message in that music that had never really been heard before, especially for young girls about female bonding. You know, that song Wannabe is all about female bonding and that each Spice Girl had her own kind of take on empowerment. Scary Spice and Posh Spice and on and on. I'm not quite sure what Baby Spice was. But the idea of finding a, a personal a way of taking on patriarchy. That was third wave feminism, uh, which is still around. The riot girl movement comes out of third wave feminism and trying to recreate something that reflects the you know millennial experiences. And then we finally started having a conversation about fourth wave feminism. And I've been pushing this issue for a long time. Um, Michael Kimmel, who you're reading, is a great example of this as well. And the idea of men taking on the issue of patriarchy, looking at how Gender is not just femaleness or femininity or what patriarchy does to femininity. It's how masculinity plays a role and also how men are hurt. I mean, think about how this idea that men are supposed to be violent and men are supposed to, you know, shoot guns and be John Wayne and all that has killed men, right? Patriarchy kills men. Think of all the men who are sick right now with COVID who won't go to the doctor because, hey, you know, that well, shows weakness. I'm not supposed to be weak. <coughs> I'll get over, I'll be fine, and then those guys are dead, right? There's a reason women live seven years longer than men on average in the United States, and part of it is because men think they just got to suck it up instead of going to the doctor. Men have uh, higher mortality rates than women. Women have higher morbidity rates, which means they report being sick, but when they report being sick to the doctor, they get help and they don't die quite as quickly. We all die at some point. Sorry to tell you. So um, so we have these sort of three waves, and now we're really sort of embracing a fourth wave of feminist theory about how men and masculinity are also a part of this and men taking it on. And, you know, there's, there's a debate. Can a man be a feminist? I don't have the personal visceral experience of patriarchy in the way that women have, but I still do. When I still I still had to play football as a high school kid just to feel like I was doing maleness, and uh, I got hurt. I got hurt. First year, I broke my tailbone. <laughs> Second year, broke my thumb. Third year, I like pulled my back. Oh yeah, patriarchy sucks. 
Um, and then also when we're talking about the historical perspective, and this is, again, going to tie into our discussion about diversity, is a notion of backlash. There was a book I should have brought with me. There was a book um, and came out in 1991 by a great Portland writer named Susan Faludi called Backlash, uh, The Undeclared War on Women, I think is the full title. And it's about how every time in our modern history that women have gained some power, there is a pushback against them to try to put them in a box. So the first wave she talks about is the suffrage movement, women getting the right to vote in 1920. And then the roaring 20s came back and said, no, women, you got to be concerned with what you look like, about fashion, Betty boop, 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 boop. Uh, don't worry about the vote. Worry about getting you a husband. Uh, and then the second wave she talks about is during World War II, when all the men went off to fight the war, and those ships and guns and tanks were all being manufactured mostly by women who had government paid uh, child care while they worked in the factory, think Rosie the Riveter, uh, but they also had their own money. They became economically empowered. And so they were experiencing, and the culture reflected this incredible empowerment while the men were, you know, fighting in the Pacific or in Europe or North Africa or a few other places. But then the war ended and those men came back and there was a backlash against that. That backlash was sort of the Marilyn Monroe. Here's here's your role model, not Rosie the Riveter, but Marilyn Monroe. That's what you need to focus on. Be a great housewife or be a glamour queen. And then she argues the second wave feminist movement created another uh, sort of position for men. We're like, ah, oh, what's happening? We're losing our women. They're becoming feminist and not getting married to the first guy that asked them and not squeezing out as many babies as we want them to and not changing their names. And now they're becoming or Ms. instead of Miss or Mrs., you know, ah. Oh. And so, you know, there became another backlash in the 1980s against female empowerment that was all about supermodels and anorexia and plastic surgery and not, you know, focus on what you look like. Uh, or else you're not valued in our society. Um, and so you could make an argument that third wave feminism created um, kind of the backlash that we're in now, the, the sort of war on women that we're talking about, including women who are losing their reproductive rights and, um, and you know, poor Melania. I feel like I should go in and break her free. <laughs> no, she's complicit. Um, so that's a real quick version of kind of the history of thinking getting to third wave and fourth wave feminism. There's also this notion that feminist theory is a paradigm, right? It's a broad, like the conflict paradigm and the functionist paradigm and the other one, symbolic interactionist. It is a broad umbrella that basically once you kind of understand it, there is a devaluing of women who you know are human and a patriarchal power structure that reinforces that there's kind of all kinds of debates and and so you know when rush limbaugh talks about feminazis he might be talking about one type of feminist but there are all types of feminists that you can imagine so i just want to briefly kind of mention the big three the first are liberal feminist theory uh feminist liberal feminist theory looks at the impact of socialization and how socialization uh teaches us gender roles right this is something we talk about in intro sociology about how Girls play with dolls and boys play with dolls called action figures, right? That we sort of get put on a pink track or a blue track as soon as we're out of the womb and, you know, being sent in opposite directions. And we learn that inequality. We learn the binary and we learn the inequality. And so liberal feminists focus on the notion of socialization that creates this imbalance. And the way to fix patriarchy is to re-socialize people. Resocialize children, create non-sexual socialization, let girls play with G.I. Joes and let boys play, you know, with dolls and, and, you know, start moving them towards similar courses and allow women to have equal access to the world as it is. That Congress, you know, there's more women in America than men, so there should be more Congress members that are female than men. It's, and we're getting better, but we're nowhere near a 50-50 parity. Uh, you know, women should be half of the CEOs. Uh, women should be half of, you know, the the people that run the banks and, you know, getting women into this world is part of the liberal feminist notion is as we change the socialization, we'll see more female representation in these institutions of power. Real quick. Marx's feminist theory, anytime you hear the word Marx, you know, capitalism sucks. Uh, look at how gender is used to reinforce capitalist power, how women are what we call from a Marxist feminist perspective, doubly marginalized, that there's double marginality, that women get it from capitalism and women get it from 
patriarchy and so women become devalued in the capitalist system and they offer themselves for free labor in the form of housewives right and i think about i mean i think a lot of people understand there's a lot of men that are like uh who are stuck at home right now like why don't we pay why why don't we pay housewives why don't we pay stay-at-home moms we should be paying them there's a shit ton of labor that's being done in the house that goes for free and that's a form of capitalist exploitation um Marxist feminists would highlight things like prostitution, that women have to sell their labor, and in a patriarchal system, their body, their physical sexual body is the one thing that they can um, sell. And so Marxist feminists, you know, would look at the solution to this problem as getting rid of capitalism. You get rid of capitalism, you get rid of exploitation, as well as patriarchal exploitation. The third uh, biggie uh, of of feminist theory is the radical feminists. The radical feminists would point out, okay, Marxist feminists, you may have some good points there, but patriarchy goes way back long before we've ever had capitalism. Right? We've got a patriarchal power structure. Just track the history of the Catholic Church, you know, the ultimate patriarchal power that goes back really far. And, and patriarchy is really the driving factor here, not the relationships of the bourgeoisie, the proletariat, the whole Marx trip. It's really about reinforcing male power. Uh, and anything that we do in society is done to that end, to reinforce male power. So, for example, radical feminists would talk about uh, the persistence of what we now call the rape culture, the fact that sexual violence against women has become so normalized in our society, whether it's in our house or we're watching it on Game of Thrones, that there is just so much violence against women that it serves to keep women in a... Uh, secondary, defensive, traumatized position. And this is reinforced in our religions. Not all religions, but the dominant religions all have a big male at the top. It's reinforced in our power structures, and everything in our power structures works to reinforce patriarchal power, male power. Um, and the way to change that is to overthrow the patriarchy, to try to dismantle it um, and um, teach men to stay at home and Bake cookies, which sounds good to me. And also being less violent and learning to shut the hell up and listen to women. Um, not just occasionally, most of the time. Uh, and there are other feminisms. There's eco-feminism. There is Islamic feminism. There's, you know, there's all, all, all kinds of feminist, feminism we can talk about. But those are the big three, liberal, Marxist, and radical. And one of the things that radical feminist theory theorists would say to liberal feminists you want women to have 50% of Congress. Okay, I get that. But you want 50% of a world that men created. Think about that. You want women to have half of all the institutions that men created. What about crime? When crime is 50% female, is that equality? When half of the serial killers in America uh, are females, is that equality? When half of the generals who are ordering strikes you know, on, on villages are female, is that equality? Let's reject the patriarchal power structure, not beg to be admitted into it. Let's tear that down and recreate a power structure based on gender equality, right? Based on the old partnership models. And those of you that know this book that I've assigned many times, The Chalice and the Blade, about the origin of patriarchy, know what that looks like. Okay, so let's bring this back. I, mean, I promise to be quick uh, about how we link this notion of patriarchy to diversity issues. And there's a whole bunch of ways. I'm going to challenge you to think about how sexism or misogyny or patriarchy impacts um, impacts notions of diversity. But I just want to give you uh, a couple, a couple, three actually. Um, well, one of the things is this power dynamic that's based on a binary is imitated in other realms. So the power dynamic based on, you know, one group being the normal, being fully formed as by God, as the normal and everybody else, you know, is re reinforced in racism, in ableism, in Islamophobia, and, you know, all these sort of biases that we have have rusted on a, on a binary in what we have discussed as othering. There's us normal people and them, right? Us versus them. That's the classic way of thinking about the binary. And so that them, you know, defining people as them is othering, and they are therefore less than, right? They are not, they might be included to the party as a token, the show that we support diversity, but they're different from us. Instead of seeing all of us, you know, the same, we're all basically the same. So the first notion is that power dynamic based on the binary allows for othering. That's point number one. Well, this sounds like something that should be good on a midterm. Hmm. 
Uh, the second one is the disparate impacts uh, on different populations when we look at the intersection of gender. What do I mean by that? When we want to talk about homophobia, for example, uh, and the negative uh, um, treatment of, of the LGBTQ plus population, um, th that impacts women differently, right? That women who are gay experience homophobia because, you know, that's devalued in our society. Just ask Ellen DeGeneres what she had to go through or how many women uh, are challenged to come out. But it also, they experience sexism as well. I mean, think about how we fetishize lesbians, right? There's a reason that hate crimes against gay people are mainly targeted at men because those types of men think lesbians are hot, right? I mean, it's become a fetishized thing. So gay women that intersection experienced that world differently. There was just a case in England about a year ago of two women who were coming home from a date. They were a long-term couple. Uh, and these guys, these young teenage boys were saying, oh, are you guys lesbians? Kiss, kiss, kiss. And then when they didn't, they attacked them. I mean, that is an intersection. Think about people with disabilities have to experience a lot of obstacles, but women with disabilities experience more obstacles because of the sexism that's placed on top of the ableism. Or think about race, you know, the obvious one, I guess, is that women of color have to face the racism that's out there, but also the sexism, including being eroticized, right? The notion that women, dark-skinned women are more sexual. I mean, this was, this was rooted in the slave trade that women from Africa were captured as concubines because, because black women, African women, were sexually, you know, unquenchable, quenchable unquenchable, you know, whatever, you know what I'm trying to say, that they're, they had a hunger for cess. So this was used to justify the rape of slaves, that these black women from Africa enjoyed sex the way the white women didn't. So there, there, when we think about diversity issues, we have to think about how gender and the intrusion of patriarchy creates an intersection on these issues. What about women? We should always, anytime that we are, if we want to t take a feminist lens, anytime we are talking about any of these issues, um, you know, it could be anti-Semitism. What about women? How are Jewish women experiencing anti-Semitism differently because of patriarchy? And then the, th the third one is something that I want us to really reflect on, and maybe we'll have a chance to talk about it in Zoom, is the masculine narrative. The masculine narrative about how men combat things and dominate things and want to have power over things versus the feminine narrative, which is typically let's have a conversation, let's find common ground, let's make sure you know people are more uh, in tune with the goals of the group. We often talk about this as the instrumental male form of leadership versus the expressive female form of leadership. Uh, and think about sort of the notion of how men exclude or we exclude people who aren't the notion of the hegemonic male, as is discussed in the Kimmel piece, that uh, we exclude uh, people. And we often do that in a very male way, but not even listening to them or letting them, t let, letting them talk, granting them access to talk because we're so awesome. And then just sort of thinking about something else while they're talking and then getting back to what we already wanted to say. You know, there is a male narrative. And so one of the things that I've been work, working on in my head is what is a feminist take on the coronavirus pandemic? And there are all kinds of feminist elements to it, including the increase in domestic violence that's happening, including how, you know, low wage female workers are kind of on the front line and aren't able to work at home and sort of on and on. But one of the main ways that we could think about this from a feminist perspective is the male narrative. It is a war on the virus, the unseen enemy, as Donald Trump talks about. He loves to talk about he's the he's a wartime president. He used that language that we're fighting a war. Um, a virus is not a person. A vi virus doesn't have morality. A virus doesn't have kind of an end game like, oh, okay, this is when I'm done. Uh, a virus just acts the way that viruses act. So maybe that masculine narrative should be contrasted with a feminine narrative that says, hey, let's listen to this. How do we live with this virus? How do we best make sure everyone's okay? How do we, instead of just fighting and conquering it, because you never kill a virus, there's still a polio virus in the world, um, that we think about how we coexist with it and, and do as little harm to our people as possible. But this, there's this real male narrative in it that we've got to smash it. And not, you know, it's fine when people want to talk about smashing hate. <laughs> I'm going to smash hate. You don't smash hate. You understand it from a feminist perspective. You understand it and you try to walk people who are 
in that world away from it. You don't smash it. There's a lot of Antifa folks that think, I'm going to go punch a Nazi in the face, and that'll teach them then they'll never be a Nazi again. Those people, it's been my experience over the last 30 plus years, that when you punch a Nazi in the nose, they become more Nazi-ish. You reach out to them and say, hey, you want to go out for some Mexican food? Let's go talk. Uh, those people start to leave that movement. So the masculine narrative uh, is something that feminists at least should be paying attention to when you talk about these diverse issues, these diversity issues. So we need to think about that and maybe we'll get into this notion of uh, how the how feminist theory can allow us to not do the binary and other people uh, can allow us to see the impact on women in different groups and girls, but especially allow us maybe to move away from the masculine narrative about smashing and destroying and going to war and all that. Donald Trump pulls up his chest. <laughs> nope. Nope. Um, nope. So, uh, so uh, let's think about those things. Uh, and uh, I'll see you soon in Zoom.